Hello and welcome to this video tutorial World Creation Environment Concept Art with 3D Matte Painting Techniques. Here you see what we're gonna build today. It's uh, the marker sketch that is the base, the blueprint for what we're gonna do. Um, we can see what we're gonna do. We're gonna create a fantasy concept art based on some kind of Lord of the Rings Minds of Moria. And uh, we have a very central architecture uh, piece uh, that is the bridge crossing in here and you see we have a lot of uh, arcs there we have a lot of architectural details and the railings and we have also the pillars we have a foreground element and that we have them in the background fading into the darkness so we have to build those and we have a beam of light here which is uh, illuminating the center center crossing of that bridge and we have a group of travelers there so we get an indication about light direction, we get an indication about perspective in this concept art. So this is really valuable for starting off so we know what we're going to do in 3D. So obviously we're going to focus on architecture modeling in 3D on this first part of a three-part series of creating this image. And uh, some things might change, some things stay the same. And uh, we uh, will decide on our way what is the most efficient way of doing stuff in 3D and in 2D, of course. Now we are here in 3D as Max, which is our primary 3D software for this tutorial. Um, I'm starting off with a simple box and all of this stuff is simple box modeling techniques. Uh, as you might see from time to time, my reference image is uh, showing up on the side. And this is an image I found online on a real real existing bridge in uh, Wales in the UK and I like the shape of the bridge, I like the uh, overall architecture it uh, is a very nice old bridge and uh, it's always good to base your designs on some kind of a real world reference and uh, so we're gonna use this as a, as a base for our modeling and from time to time we're gonna change some stuff but uh, most of the time we're gonna stick to it so the best way of approaching something like that is of course not to model the entire bridge in one piece. What we're going to do is, and I'm cutting you know, the mesh accordingly to that, we're only going to build one arc and one pillar. Because these are the two elements that, you know, if you repeat them, you will get an entire bridge. And instead of modeling the entire bridge, we're only going to focus on this, this small area. The main advantage of that is we can really focus on the details, we don't have to bother about an entire mesh, and operations like edge selection, face selection and beveling is done much much faster. And it's much more controllable because it's such a small model. So with uh, shift click select you can select face loops and do some kind of extrusions like details like this one here. And with uh, um, edge selections you can do chamfering and uh, connecting to get the edges in between and uh, just with a few operations like that you can pretty much create every architecture model uh, from super complex to uh, from super uh, easy to super complex and uh, although uh, that we are just modeling for a still we want to make sure we get some kind of you know quad mesh topology in here because this will help later on uh, for texturing and uh, uh, it's always good to you know do your best whatever you can to make the mesh as good as possible. We don't take too much uh, attention right now on the scale of our mesh because again we are only going to model for a still so we can uh, change this later on anyway and uh, the only thing we are looking you know into right now is the overall proportion of this bridge and uh, trying to make the shapes as good as possible. I'm always trying to make it as low poly as possible and as high poly as needed. So um, don't, talk, go, don't go too crazy right away on the polygon count. And uh, with a few uh, uh, connections and a few extrusions you get a really quick uh, and good result here. And even though I'm a bit struggling uh, with this arc right now, it's just a matter of time and you get there. And uh, as you can see it's, it's not too complicated to uh, to do this kind of stuff. And now we are already done with our one piece and with just duplicating and welding the vertices we get to a final bridge element which is pretty much the length we want to have it. And we will not focus on the beginning and the end of the bridge because we don't gonna, don't gonna see that 
uh, in the final image anyway. I'm now just placing an entire new cube on top of our bridge, which will be the, uh, the surface of the bridge. And uh, although I'm now measuring here with the, um, uh, with the connect operation how many uh, subdivisions we're going to need, in the end I'm going to decide to do the topping uh, the same way I did the pillars and the arc. Uh, I'm going to do it the same way. I'm just going to build one section with a balcony sticking out do all my beveling and detailing and then I'm gonna duplicating it and welding it together again. It's just for pretty much all architecture elements like houses or um, you know houses with a lot of columns and temples you can approach it this way. You only model one nice element and then you duplicate it because that's what you can do really really well in a computer. Uh, you know just take one existing model and uh, duplicate it a uh, hundred of times and to, to get mass and to get, a, to get it done. So if you think about a, a house you would only need to model pretty much one window, one door, uh, you know one section of roof, one wall and you can pretty much create an entire house if you want and if you don't need any variations. And uh, we don't need to bother about modeling variations right now because that's in fact what we're gonna do in, uh, in 2D and in Photoshop. So we are only looking in the most efficient way of setting this up in 3D. We are not going to bother about um, complicated uh, unwrapping of the UVs. We are only looking into fast uh, modeling here. I'm now creating a cube which is roughly the size of a human uh, to get some scale going on. And I decided to widen the, the bridge a tiny bit and also to duplicating it and get the crossing going. And now I'm placing a camera and uh, set up the framing and the final uh, perspective of my uh, of my um, of my uh, image and uh, I'm uh, trying to stay organized put everything on separate layers because it will help later on if the scene gets more complex and uh, in general that's a good rule for big environments like that obviously I'm not able to cover the entire modeling process but um, as you can see now here, the bridge stayed the same and I pretty much only added the railing to the bridge and some minor details, the background wall with the big gate and the pillars, which are all the same element except the one in the front and uh, they are only instance so they will not uh, affect our render time too much. Without f you know uh, anything else, I'm gonna go into the lighting process because before I'm gonna tweak any materials I want to get the lighting and the mood set as soon as possible. The easiest way of doing that is just to override all the materials in the scene with a grey standard material and setting up GI and basic render settings. Um, in this way we will get just the pure geometry and can focus on the lighting and set of the materials. Again to support the GI because it's pretty much like a cave-like environment where the light source is only gonna go you know, into the scene through that big gate in the end, we're gonna place a ground geometry and some shadow casters on each side to block the GI from outside uh, from our set. And I'm gonna add a ceiling as well just to block out the light in, you know, uh, you know, in the entire scene. And now I'm only gonna do a test render, very noisy, on 1200 pixels of wide resolution. And the reason for that is we want to get super fast feedback. We don't want to wait for you know the render to show up. We don't want to think about a clean render right now. What we want is fast feedback. We want to do creative decisions as quick as possible. So that's what we are looking forward now. And as you might see in the renderer, there were some black you know faces showing up, and that's the reason because I I just pretty much moved the two bridge pieces together without uh, you know welding the vertices. And, uh, but just with offsetting uh, the pieces, again, I can get rid of those. But of course, if we would build a, an, a real asset, you know, that is made for to go through the pipeline, uh, we would uh, take much more uh, attention to that and we would fix that. But for still, we don't mind. We want to get a fast, cool result as fast as possible. I'm now going to place my light and I'm going to use a VUA area light because I want to get a really, really hot white beam uh, through this gate. And uh, as you see, we are starting to get something, but uh, the intensity is way too low. So I'm going to raise that a lot. And now we are suddenly starting to see the, the results what uh, we want. But overall, the image is way too bright. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to 
I'm gonna place the uh, the roof again on our you know, sh you know on over our scene, which will make the scene way too dark. So we're gonna have to find a, a good compromise between realistic darkness, realistic environment, and a good way to light our scene. Uh, so I'm gonna shift the ceiling over a tiny bit to get let in a bit more light, but still maintain uh, darkness a bit. And of course we're gonna change a few things later on in Photoshop, but uh, we want to try to get as close as possible uh, in the renderer. I'm now switching my secondary bounce engine of the GI to light cache to make the render much much more faster. Uh, even brute force is the most accurate way of uh, calculating the GI with V-Ray. Uh, light cache is much more suitable for this kind of uh, environment because it's pretty much an interior environment and we don't um, and we can't calculate this on brute force, it will just take too long. So we're gonna use a light cache or irradiance method to interpolate between uh, to interpolate the GI a bit, which will make the render much cleaner, much faster, as you can see now. So we're gonna start to get something here, and just to make things clearer, I'm gonna setting up uh, some basic render elements like the diffuse, uh, lighting, uh, GI, reflection, refraction, the corresponding filters, uh, specularity, and uh, depth. And with those uh, render elements, I'm not setting these up for final render right now. The only thing I'm setting these up is I want to uh, check those and see what my light does. I want to see how bright my, my GI is independently from uh, the beauty because sometimes it can be really, really tough see, to see what's going on by just looking at the beauty. And uh, as you might uh, remember from the initial marker sketch, there was a lot of, you know, haze in the in the concept because we could see the light beam and pretty much the only way of approaching that in a 3D program is to, is to fill the scene with a volume and uh, there is a very elegant and good way of doing that in V-Ray and that's a V-Ray environment fog. So I added the V-Ray environment fog to the atmosphere tab in 3ds Max and uh, the trickiest way, you know, way of doing that is uh, to figure out how big and um, how dense the, the fog has to be because we have basically two values to adjust. We have the fog height and the fog distance which will define the density and uh, the amount of fog in the scene. And there is a nice trick of doing it. I'm just creating a box and I see in the, uh, in the, in the, in the creation uh, uh, toolbar at the right uh, how high my box is and I'm gonna fill in these values into the, uh, into the, into the fog settings and work with these values because they will give me a good indication how far away the, the fog should start from the camera. Obviously the fog has uh, you know, a strong influence on the lights in the scene as well and uh, it's gonna darken the, the, the lights of my scene and it's gonna affect the GI and it's also gonna uh, affect the shadows. It will make everything a lot more softer. And a good way to, uh, to check what's really going on with the fog is to add the V-Ray atmosphere render element and I just did this and I checked it and my, my V-Ray atmosphere uh, element was pure black so nothing was going on. So I could change the values and I'm gonna re-render again, change the settings. This is a lot of try and error actually. There are no real good values that you can set every time because it's so, you know, uh, you, it's so much related to the scene scale, it's so strongly related to the lights you're using, but now we get something and the beauty you know, it's very, very noisy, but we get something. But uh, we uh, we can adjust the, the intensity of the light, the, the shaping, and to help this a little bit, and to make this even more defined. And actually, this is the really interesting uh, part, I think, of, uh, of 3D, because right now we are really shaping uh, the environment, we are really shaping our vision, what kind of light we want, um, what are the colors of the light. We uh, established the entire composition and uh, we get a you know we start making an image here because you don't have to think about 3d just as a creation for perspective or geometry that will help you later on it can really define the entire you can really define the entire look in 3d and uh, some of you may say oh I'm, I'm probably way faster in Photoshop and this might be correct but um, as I like to think uh, you know if you start with a better 3D uh, rendering, your uh, painting will be even better later on. So uh, if you can do some stuff in 3D, uh, go for it. So we got a nice atmospheric effect, but what we are missing compared to the concept is the really strong light beam. 
and there's really no good way of doing that with the V-Ray light. So what I'm going to do now is I'm placing a spotlight, 3ds Max spotlight, which is much better to control because I can control the fall off and the attenuation independently. And uh, in this way I can angle it and control it much much better. And uh, if you can see this in my test render now, I'm starting to get the beam in the in the in, uh, in the in the bridge crossing in the center of the image. So I'm now shaping my image, and I get this really nice beam. And it's just now we have all the elements in place, and now it's just a matter of placing in them, uh, adjusting them, uh, changing the intensity, and and getting the desired look here. Because right now what I'm struggling with is the light is you know going till the end of the bridge and we wanted to pretty much stop it in the in the center of the bridge because we want to have the attention of the of the viewer in the just in the center of the of the bridge so what i'm going to do now is just a few settings here so the light will actually stop after after a certain point and we will not have too much lighting uh, going on there and um, Again, you might be faster in 2D, but it's so great if you can get this in a renderer because all the elements will interact. You know, your light will interact with the fog, the geometry will interact with the fog and the lighting, and the textures will interact with them. So you get a lot for free in the renderer, and you don't need to uh, to think about that later on. And if that's just five more minutes playing with some light sources and intensities, that's definitely a step to go. So I would highly recommend uh, recommend doing that. And uh, as you just see, I'm just adjusting basically the light position to get what I want. And now we're getting really, really close to the final, to the final image uh, of the, the the final lighting of the image because that's what we want. And um, I'm again, I'm not concerned about noise right now. I'm not concerned about the render quality because uh, this is all secondary, and we can change that later on. What we're looking for right now is to get fast feedback that we can make decisions as fast as possible so it's a lot of balancing the lights as you can see now i'm gonna go back to the uh, to the uh, v-ray light to the area light and adjust its size there and what i did as well i now it's changed my primary bounds now to radiance map with a, which is also a gi method that will speed up the interior lighting a, a lot and will make the image much much cleaner with uh, less render time during the process of this 3D, I decided I want to add another element that was not in the initial sketch, and that is vegetation. I want to have that ivy overground this entire bridge. And obviously, we could find images and we could draw that, but it's not interacting with the light in that way. And actually, there is a really, really amazing tool for that. It's called Grow Ivy from GroovoRare, and it's, an, uh, it's a plugin for 3ds Max, but it's also a standalone application. And uh, for the standalone application, you only need to export your geometry as an OBJ and it will interact and it's all great. But in Max, it's just a modifier. And it's so cool because you can just place this locator, click Grow Ivy, and adjust all kinds of settings. As you can see here, I, uh, I can uh, adjust the size of the leaves, I can adjust the size of the branches, and I can adjust the density of the leaves. So I want to have more leaves, I have more leaves now. And with just, you know, two or three clicks, I pretty much overgrown my entire geometry here. And it interacted beautifully with all the geometry in the scene. And um, I got a very realistic example here. And um, with not a lot of effort. And if that's uh, a good way of doing that, that's definitely a good, uh, a good idea. And I can also change the resolution of the mesh. The mesh gets quite heavy soon, so I recommend being careful with that. But uh, for the distance stuff, as we are going to use it, uh, you can just leave it at four sides and it will be fine. You can also adjust the seed while you are growing. So you can grow something, stop it and adjust the seed. Also I want to uh, show you some of the settings because right now I, um, uh, I adjusted the up vector to something really high which uh, will cause that the ivy is not, does not grow a lot on the ground. It will you know, force it to grow more upwards and uh, eventually stop when there is no way of growing up more and more. So you see we, we created a very interesting shape just by uh, changing one uh, value here, which is the up vector, which will force everything to grow up. On the other hand, what we can do is we can decrease the, gra decrease the gravity as well, which force the uh, ivy to grow up as well, but uh, it will be not 
you know, it will be much, much straighter and much more simpler. On the other hand, we can uh, increase the gravity value to something like 2 or 5, which will press the ivy down to the ground, so it will stay a lot more to the ground, which, uh, you know, can create very interesting things as well. Two other values are quite interesting. It's the max length, which will pretty much define how long the branches will be. So you see, we create these really nice winds uh, going down from the from the plane, and there is um, uh, so you can create some really nice effects like that. Other way of doing that stuff is uh, you can change uh, another value, which is the um, which is the branching value. So if we set the branching value up, it will branch a lot more. If you decrease the branching value, it will branch less. So you will get more and more longer branches. So just with adjusting those four values, you can create some really cool uh, uh, pieces of vegetation which are not looking like ivy at all. Um, in fact, if you uh, uh, increase the max length a lot and push the up vector up, you can create something that looks almost like a young tree and not like an overgrown ivy wall at all. And if you then, you know, switch on the leaves, uh, you get a very interesting, uh, nice looking uh, young tree which uh, can be used in a lot of scenes. So uh, don't think about this tool just as an ivy generator, think about it like an, an, you know, a plant generator. It's pretty awesome and it's for free, so please check it out. I'm now going to use it in my scene here, and as you might notice, my um, up vector is really, really low because I want to press the IV down and to cover as um, uh, most as possible of the of the actual surface of the bridge. You also notice I uh, added another element, uh, compositional element to my bridge, which is this center chair. It's a it's a stone throne. Uh, which uh, hopefully story-wise will support the idea of this long forgotten kingdom and uh, which is overgrown and uh, and uh, will uh, start telling a story because every good environment tells a, tells a story. It's not just about beautiful imagery, it's also about story which is kind of interesting. So I'm now placing various locators at uh, the pillars and uh, on top of the bridge to grow uh, across the bridge, which is a lot of fun. Uh, because, you know, with a few clicks you can so quickly detail um, the bridge and uh, it interacts so nicely with your bridge. Because even though if you would do this, we try to paint this in Photoshop, it, it will never interact with the light and the geometry so nice as it does in 3D. And uh, it's so fast, so there's really no lose of time. The only recommendation I can give is, usually on a big scene like that, where you have uh, um, an environment that is, uh, you know, hundreds of meters long, it can be really tough growing something like that, especially with the max length and the branching values. So uh, you might find uh, it easily to uh, more easier to scale down your environment and uh, and get. Um, uh, to a tenth of a scale and to get the grow iving working on on this scale because it works much better on a smaller scale the next step is we're gonna scatter some uh, some uh, props on our bridge so I created this really really low risk small uh, rock and also a shield and uh, I found this helmet of a knight online and uh, I created this lens it's just a cylinder extruded deformed at the top with a helix around it and I also found this bridge online, a free model, so I downloaded it, modified it a tiny bit, and they all have very basic uh, shaders on it. Another element we're gonna need is a big rock, so for this uh, purpose I downloaded the script from ScriptSpot, which is a g great resource for Mac script, and it's called the AA Rock Generator. And you just load the script and you hit create, and it will create a really nice looking rock. And the cool thing is, it only creates it from 3ds Max procedurals inside. It will create this modifier stack, and we can even go into this modifier stack and adjust settings. And there is really at the base a Turbo Smooth modifier, which uh, defines the uh, resolution of the mesh and also of the rock. So you want to keep this uh, quite high because you want to see a nice rock, but also keep in mind you will want to scatter this a hundred times or so in our scene. So don't go too crazy on the polygon count. At last, I'm always uh, adding an additional FFD modifier. It's like a lattice in Maya, 
and uh, I make some adjustments so I'm flattening this rock out at the base so we can scatter it really good so it looks like it lays on the ground and also keep in mind that the pivot origin will uh, later on in the scattering define the rotation pivot so you might want to adjust that as well so this is a really uh, fast and efficient way of creating good looking props and rocks and landscape features for your scenes and uh, don't spend too much time on it because it's only going to be visible in a distance and we're going to paint on top of it but it's nice to get a base I'm going to use uh, another free tool which is called the Advanced Painter which is a Max script as well and it is basically a geometry painter so you select the target geometry, you select the scatter geometry in this case uh, the shield and you can input minimum and maximum values for rotation and scaling and also for translation actually and then you just uh, paint on your uh, on your uh, target geometry and uh, although this is a great way of scattering really really fast geometry I always believe in uh, a bit of you know manual work in here because if you uh, if you do this kind of work and uh, modify it a tiny bit the way you want to have the pieces placed it will always help to to give it a more manual a more you know a more convincing look because it's 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 going to be a bit more purposeful than just random scattering so now I'm I'm scattering the helmet and uh, yeah it's really really fast but sometimes you want to you know make some custom adjustments but if you quickly want to scatter something this script is really a good resource and again it's so nice because it will interact with the IV it will interact with the lighting and be pretty pretty helpful uh, for doing stuff like that I'm now scaling down my scene again because I noticed that one of the pillar is quite uh, is quite empty still so I'm placing another grow ivy uh, instance and quickly overgrow this pillar and you see how fast it is it's so it's so convenient it's so great and I'm just applying a basic V-Ray material to it and uh, with no texture at all it's just color because this scene is really dependent on the on the on the depth on the on the on the lighting we don't need a lot of texture information in fact I think the only texture I really applied was the bridge which got a brick texture as a bump map everything else is pretty much gray shaded uh, you could put much more detail obviously and effort into this stuff but there is really no need for it so now we are setting up the final render elements and one that is really useful and important are the material IDs and it's the multi matte element in 3ds max and what it does it will create a a colored mask later on and uh, a red, a green and a blue mask for us uh, and uh, this red, green and blue channel is corresponding to a number and uh, it will make things really easy in Photoshop later on so to add an object you just select the object and go to the object properties and in the G buffer you just place the number of the object ID which is in this case 11 so it will show up green in the final renderer which is really good and easy and the only other very you know added render element is the uh, V-Ray extra text, and V-Ray extra text allows us to place a custom texture, and it will override all the materials in the scene. And this in this case it's a V-Ray dirt, which will generate an ambient occlusion pass, which uh, will be helpful for uh, uh, to paint some custom ambient occlusion areas where we want it. Uh, now we push render, and now we are rendering at almost 4K and uh, we are rendering it with best settings we are rendering irradiance map and light cache because that's the best way of doing an interior like that and uh, everything else is pretty much straightforward so uh, this is uh, gonna take a bit because of the volumetrics obviously but uh, from the moment we have this in place we're gonna have a nice looking render of hopefully noise free and then we can uh, start to paint over on it uh, another thing uh, that is really important in this case is to really watch the noise because the only thing we don't want to do is re you know remove the noise later on we're gonna get well, we want to get a solid base in 3d so it's useful to watch that thank you very much for your attention um, I hope we see you in uh, part two so uh, goodbye <laughs>